Welcome to the Silicon Valley Podcast with your host, Sean Flynn, who interviews famous entrepreneurs, venture capitalists, and leaders in tech. Learn their secrets and see tomorrow's world today. Kyle, thank you for taking the time today to be on the Silicon Valley Podcast. Now, I'm super excited for you to be here. We've had several conversations before this. Your history, your background is absolutely amazing. For our audience at home, can you give a little bit of an introduction to yourself and to your career up until this point? Excellent. Great. Yeah, Sean, thank you for having me. So I'm Kyle York. I'm CEO uh, and managing partner of York IE. Uh, We call ourselves a vertically integrated strategic growth and investment firm. Uh, And I believe this company is the manifestation of my entire career. You know, I grew up in New Hampshire in a small family business. Uh, I just was telling Sean one of five uh, siblings. Uh, So there's five brothers. I have have four brothers, five sons. Uh, We grew up in a small family business that was a sporting goods store. And I grew up playing sports and being competitive. And that naturally led me. uh, I went to Bentley uh, University, which is a business school outside of Boston. I played four years of college football there uh, and fortunately got internships right after my freshman year in technology. uh, And I had a career in sort of marketing and sales uh, track. So I've always worked in B2B software, uh, software as a service SaaS businesses. I started in vertical SaaS. And then really my uh, longest journey in tenure, I spent 11 years at a company called Dine. That was an internet infrastructure company out of Manchester, New Hampshire, my hometown, uh, that um, we actually ended up selling to Oracle in late 2016. Uh, And then I ended up running uh, the business unit and cloud strategy for Oracle Cloud for three years before 2019 when I launched York IE. So again, always Sean and go to market roles, um, sales and marketing at Dine. During that run, I was chief revenue officer. Before that, I actually moved from New Hampshire uh, to California for a few years um, for my company before that. As a regional, I uh, had to go to market. Um, so just cut my teeth, climb the ladder, and uh, I'm excited to be doing what I'm doing today. And you got something that's very interesting that no one else has told me, but it makes sense. Once a year, you do a 30-day podcast roadshow. Can you tell me about the inspiration behind that? And you know, being a podcast host myself, I just love that idea. How, how have the results been? Yeah, so I, I believe incredibly in um, leaders of companies uh, having a personal brand, but also having that personal brand be their company's brand, right? You know, I hate when I see you know, my views here are, are, are my own, not my company's, right? I think those things need to be the same uh, in 2021, 2022, right? I mean, it's just a different ball game. So once a year, we decided to do, we launched York IE, we practice what we call drumbeat marketing, and we help startups with growth. And one of those programs is our Marcom module for drumbeat marketing. And that's really about having a strong point of view about your industry, your market, what you stand for, really tight messaging, and then taking that through all distribution channels to the world. Um, So obviously, podcasting is a great uh, way to get your message, uh, to share thoughts, education, inspiration. Uh, and instead of doing our own podcast, we said, you know, there's so many great podcast hosts, podcast hosts and podcasts out there with different audiences and more expansive reach. How about every year we do a tour uh, where we join everybody else's podcasts and then we kind of package them up on our website uh, as you know, a season. So I'm actually in season three of our podcast tour. We do like 10 to 15 in that 30 day, you know, 45 day window. And then we also promote them. And a big, big part of our mantra is rising tides lifts all ships. And, you know, we think it exposes everybody to each other's audiences and, uh, really helps lift everybody up. And you had talked about startup founders and helping build their brand and getting some exposure. How successful do you think startup founders are right now with building a personal brand? What advice, what suggestions do you have for them to improve on it? Well, there's certainly a lot of clutter out there. and There's a lot of competition for eyeballs and ears. Uh, You know, I think I've built a career as a um, kind of go-to-market uh, complement to technical founders. So most software companies and internet companies that get founded today tend to get founded by engineers. Uh, engineers tend to be a little bit more introverted um, or uh, less maybe um, evangelical as maybe I am uh, when it relates to you know spreading the gospel for my my companies. Um, so I think 
there's a lot of different forums nowadays, a lot more process, uh, programs, construct, uh, platforms uh, to spread that voice on. And, you know, a big part about what I've fostered both as an operator, but also as an angel and an advisor over the years is to help founders, executives get out of their comfort zone, find their unique mediums and pathways to spread their message and to do that appropriately. You know, when we spent time at Oracle, my boss there, EVP, um, hated public speaking. Um, and he didn't like to, you know, prioritize content production per se. So a lot of times what we would do is we would, um, in t- inside internal meetings, we'd actually transcribe everything he'd say. Then we'd pull out a lot of pull quotes, um, use them as social assets, uh, create short form blog posts and Q&As with him out of what he said internally, and then just get him to give the damn approval to post it. Um, But he didn't even necessarily know he was doing it. This is very commonplace um, for us and how we have to work with many tech founders uh, and and what we're doing today. So you mentioned that, you know, there's a strategy behind getting that tech founder, that engineer to get his message out. If there wasn't that team behind, you know, this marketing team to be able to push that content from internal means, say it's just a small team, three, four people, how would you get that that technical founder, that engineer to get his voice out there? Or I guess more important, my question is, for an early stage company, how important is it that there is one of the co-founders or the founder to be that brand voice, to be in the public's eye? I mean, I think it's critical. And I think, again, there's a lot of different forums and mediums to do it. Not everybody's going to go on a podcast tour or do a bunch of speaking gigs, but you need to figure out how to get that clear message, that concise point of view to market. So a lot of times what you'll see is it may not even be a founder or maybe a hired, you know, head of sales, or it might be a marketing person. Um, It's not about the team size. It's more about the buy-in from the very top, from the founders, from the executives, from the board, from the investors to, to stand for something and then bring that something to market again, through whatever medium is most comfortable is most consistent. Um, again, we call this drumbeat marketing because it's with, with really tight messaging and positioning. And then again, standing for something from a kind of pithy or unique point of view, um, you can be disrupted. The thing is, it's a long game approach. So you need to do it every day, all day till you're blue in the face because the world really isn't hearing you. Um, and you, so you just need to find those mechanisms to do it. In many companies, uh, the companies can do this really well. And the company, you know, a brand is the manifestation of all of its people, its technologies, its capabilities, bringing it out to market. Um, so it's not always like an individual person, but it's certainly the buy-in uh, to do it really, really well and consistently that I, we believe helps the best companies stand out. Now, let's talk about more about your area of expertise, B2B SaaS. This industry has changed a lot over the years. Can you talk about the evolution of it? Absolutely. So, I mean, companies like York IE didn't exist when I got into B2B SaaS in the early 2000s, right? So you know, nowadays, there's all sorts of blogs and books and, you know, KPI benchmarks and, you know, amazing content that's put out there about how to build and scale a B2B software business and really think about it as a recurring revenue. SaaS is a business model, um, a recurring revenue uh, business model, right? Um, so in this day and age in B2B SaaS, uh, there's just a lot more resources out there. When we created York IE, what I was trying to see if I could manifest was as an operator in a day-to-day fashion, as a chief revenue officer, I was really much focused on how do I scale these businesses to the moon. We, we scaled down to 100 million ARR before we sold it to Oracle. And what I realized is in my in my moonlighting, my advisory, my angel investing, I was becoming that value add resource, that first call for founders on how to build, grow, scale uh, their companies. And inevitably, ex- those companies work with a banker like yourself and, and, and get companies monetized inevitably at the end. Um, and so when we created York IE, what I was trying to do, I, I surveyed the la- landscape. I was trying to figure out hey, can we build a company, a scalable business that can bring infrastructure, human resources, services and capability uh, and capital uh, to companies at the earliest stages where they need the help the most to be really, really smart money to help them scale. So I think you're seeing every single company, every single industry. If you're a company, uh, you're trying to become recurring and you're seeing every industry have SaaS solutions brought to them 
Uh, because again, companies want to become recurring. The reason they want to be recurring revenue business model companies is because those companies are the most predictable, the most sustainable, and uh, create the largest enterprise value. Kyle, this is interesting that you're taking all these resources and bringing it into one location. Did the whole ecosystem the environment for SaaS companies change thir- during the pandemic? I mean, were there were there changes? I mean, I remember hearing it's been a year and a half already. Things on the news going, companies are no longer going to need these SaaS products because they're working at home or they've now realized that they had all these uh, reoccurring payments that aren't needed that were just fluff for their company. I mean, what happened at the beginning of the pandemic to a lot of these companies? What's happening now? I don't think there's ever been a better time to be a B2B SaaS business. Um, you know, if you think about it, everybody going home means everybody is now online and everybody needs to do their job um, from a very transient environment, whether they're at the home or office or on the road, uh, the world's just changed. So we've actually seen nothing but momentum in B2B SaaS. I think there's always been a problem of shadow IT and you know too many tools, too many capabilities, um, too much inefficiency across companies. But this is just creating bigger and bigger platform plays and there will be more and more consolidation. Um, that's why you're seeing so much um, money and capital like fly into B2B SaaS because there's more and more companies that are going to be able to get really, really big in B2B SaaS, and be these big platforms and consolidators, um, which means there's going to be more and more M&A, uh, which only leads to, to, again, more and more value creation for entrepreneurs and talent and, and folks that are in our professions. Um, so again, we've seen it all as momentum. I think one thing that's accelerated too is those dormant sort of legacy industries. Uh, those are also now seeing far more disruption in SaaS, whether they're service business models or licensed software business models or hardware business models. Um, the SaaS model is now being implemented in you know different sectors that you wouldn't have seen before, maybe oil and gas or manufacturing or um, you know, we we have investments in like um, like operating systems for like, you know, quick serve um, restaurants and service workers coming to your home. Again, things that just wouldn't have been accelerated as much prior to the pandemic. Do you think right now with the way SaaS is pretty much taking over everything, or at least that the way that everyone wants to see that reoccurring payment model, that that's going to be ubiquitous throughout everything from you know, mowing your lawn, that monthly payment to plow in the snow, monthly payment. Do you see that that almost as being an expectation from investors in the future? Yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, I think you are seeing the recurring revenue business model take shape, whether it's B2B or B2C. I mean, whether it's your, I mean, think about how many like over the top um, on-demand, you know, video services you have. I just, I just had to set up for Apple TV because I really, really want to watch, you know, uh, a show. And, and it's just like, ah, it's like another one I have to buy. Right. So I think that's happening, but I think what you're seeing a lot in B2B SaaS is you're also seeing a lot of like SaaS plus business models or uh, pay as you go business models. It's, you know, if you think about the cloud and the nature of like on-demand software in the cloud, uh, it really does lend itself to, you know, what is your consumption model and what amount of service are you using or how many seats do you have? Um, and so I think there's not just like recurring from a contractual perspective, but also just a consistent, scalable, up and to right consumption model. Um, so it's funny, even though there's SaaS and recurring, we're seeing so much it's pay as you go as well and consumption based and more flexible on contract terms uh, than maybe historically has been. Um, so that's also changing the game. Like how many subscriptions do you get that are actually really just monthly that you can walk from at any time? And what that's doing is it's um, making the market have to deliver an amazing user experience and customer service to not just win the account, but expand that account, retain that account, turn that account into a loyal advocate and let the flywheel uh, persist. So, yeah, I think it's happening, but I, I think you're also seeing a lot of flexibility in the way companies are engaging with their customers so that it's not like lock in, like, you know, old school where you're like trapped and unhappy. Do you think that SaaS companies now are early, early stage startups? Are they thinking about developing their company for 
an acquisition as a platform play, or do you think they're developed their, their companies as a standalone going out to market? Because it seems like right now, as you mentioned, so many of these companies are just rolling up the these early stage companies. What's your thoughts? The way we talk about this is is we we look at three companies, three types of companies. This is what we see, right? Like we see about a hundred inbound B two B SaaS companies a month looking for capital. So let's say they're fundraising at that seed pre seed stage. So in all these companies, there's three types we see. There's the company with like the enormous vision, you know, be this platform, disrupt their industry, mark, you know, massive market, huge total addressable market. But then we're like, we look at them and we're like, yeah, but where's the plan? Like, what's the practical, pragmatic execution plan to, to build towards that? Then we see companies that are like, you know, more maybe they're vertical SaaS or they're niche or they're a feature, not a or a product, not a platform play, but they have a very, very clear point and shoot business model. We're going after this industry vertical, this market segment, this buyer persona with this repeatable value prop and use case, and we're going to go build it. But geez, then we look at them, we're like, yeah, but that's a small TAM or a small service addressable market. I'm not sure how big of a company that could be. Is that even a venture backable company? The best companies we see, Sean, merge both. They have this huge vision, a grand TAM, but they're not trying to boil the ocean on day one. They have a very clear feature or product or market segmentation or vertical attack um, or, or land and expand business model that they're bringing to market that will then unlock the next phase of their journey, the next phase of their journey, the next phase of their journey to then go potentially be a great company. What's happened though in our Silicon Valley funding culture is that the funds have now gotten so damn large and the rounds have gotten so damn big that that startups are eliminating all of their optionality along the way to play for singles, doubles, triples, uh, you know, and maybe even have a sacrifice fly to get the, 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 the company to an exit. Venture capital is playing power law and the funds are so large that everybody needs to be chasing unicorn status at the earliest stages. And that means that so many companies, even with a 50, 100, 200 million dollar exit, might be deemed Silicon Valley failures, even though they're good, healthy little companies with great little exits. Right. So I think there's a power dynamic at play uh, that's happening that's kind of making this all very complicated to measure you know, who wins and in, in, in the aggregate. That's interesting. And I definitely want to dive into the, the VC model in a second. But before that, it was talked about, you know, so much money coming into this space right now, especially here in, the, in Silicon Valley over the last two years. There's been a lot of people that have made quite a bit of money. There's a lot of new family offices. Uh, single family, multifamily offices, a lot of money going into the space. Are you seeing this as a good thing or not that these family offices are now starting to, you know, dive into this sector? They want this as part of their portfolio. I think there's two ways to kind of pick that apart. I think family offices who've made their money in tech, wonderful, right? I mean, they are domain experts. They have expertise. Uh, they have been in the game, in the market, in the industry understand the investing climate, understand what it takes to build a big and successful company and to eventually monetize a company in an asset. So I think family offices from tech, think about it, it's just a focused family office in the domain they know. I think that when you see family offices from other sectors um, who just are looking at it as um, asset diversification and getting into alternative, I think it's very tricky, right? I, I recommend those family offices and multifamily offices find partners, uh, whether that's VC funds or syndicate models or hire great people, if they're going to direct invest, who are experts and specialists in the markets, in the tech sector that they're backing. Um, you know, I think asset diversification is great. I mean, I'm a huge believer. I have an unfair share of my personal and family net worth in tech, but that's because that's my core domain area. Um, and I think that's just the dynamic that needs to happen. If you're from tech, sure, you know, go ahead and invest in your domain. If you're not, find partners strategically to to latch onto and, and collaborate with. So say you do have a background in tech and that's the space you're familiar with. How would family offices play in the current fund and model with companies? Uh, and do you see it, it as a good fit or not? What are, what are your thoughts? Where, where, where does it fit in this 
investment chain? Yeah, I mean, family offices have in in high you know high net worth individuals, ultra high net worth individuals have been LPs in funds for decades, right? I mean, some of the first funds that were ever created, the biggest funds were started with, you know, GP, LP money um, for major, major, major uh, successes. So I think this is very commonplace. Um, what you're seeing more and more, though, is family office wanting to go to re- directly into companies. And the biggest family offices are looking more and like more and more like big venture capital firms or uh, big private equity firms. The difference being it's their own money, right? So there's less of the economic model of, you know, two, 3% management fees and, you know, 20 to 30% carry. Uh, It's their own money. So it's really about, you know, uh, cash on cash returns, which makes it, you know, uh, very hands-on, um, you know, caring sort of type of money, right? Usually these family offices are building their own family office of their own staff of legal accounting, administration, uh, deal diligence, all the jazz. But if they're not, they're they're collaborating with their multifamily office or they're deploying via uh, venture capital funds or private equity funds. Uh, so, you know, I think there, yes, there's more and more money. Um, I think though it's trying to access an asset class that they need to be domain experts in and or find partners to um, give them that access to the to that spread. So you'd mentioned, you know, in the past, a lot of LPs and funds were family offices. Right now in the whole venture capital model, do you think it's prime for disruption? Yes, no. What are your thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, a lot of times what you see with the family offices, not just in the venture model historically, but there has also been um, single purpose vehicles created for individual deals where different investors are brought together, you know, kind of pass the hat to invest in a company. You're now seeing the rolling fund model uh, happen. You saw Sequoia go with like an evergreen fund model, giving it kind of no fund one through 10, you know, structure, kind of eliminating timelines. What we've done at York IE is we've built what we call an evergreen syndicate model. Uh, We believe this is the best of like rolling fund meets um, SPV structure. It's a, a LLC entity structure, master series structure. And what we do is we get five year commitments um, annual dollar amounts over that five-year commitment, and and every investor gets a sliver of every single deal uh, that we do over that over that commitment, and then it's just deal by deal economics. There's no management fee. We only get paid on the gains on a deal by deal basis on a carry on the upside. So again, this is a unique model, but it's similar. Uh, to the rolling fund model you hear about or kind of rolling SPVs you hear about. We've just created our own construct that we've found family offices, multifamily offices, and high net worth individuals uh, really like because it's more transparent. It's more always on. It's single K1. It's passed through gains and losses as they happen. Um, So your money's not gone in a fund for 10, 12 years. Uh, You actually see the fruits of the returns and you can parlay your own capital. How often when you say this model to people, do they go, aha, uh-huh, or are they like, Kyle, could you explain this a little bit deeper? Uh, yeah, I know. It's, it's, it's very rarely an aha. Uh-huh. I think it takes some time. I, I need to answer a lot of questions. Um, whenever you're innovating or disrupting a model, everyone always asks, well, why aren't you just doing what's been done? You know, a lot of investors pattern map across all the different places they invest. And if you don't match to that pattern, then, you know, you got to explain it a little bit more. I think when people hear the end-to-end York IE model of we're building a company, a SaaS platform for data and automation, a services suite, and then layering on capital, a company that invests, not just an early stage VC fund that offers services and capability, I think people really resonate with that. When they hear, oh, you're creating like a McKinsey, a modern McKinsey, Bain, you know, Gartner, you know, with a capital pool, it's almost like corporate venture at some point, right? It's just that we're a startup too, purpose built to help other B2B SaaS startups scale. And, you know, I think when we get to scale, it'll be very clear and obvious. Um, I think it's just that we're growing at the same time. Our, our capital pool is growing and our startup investments are growing. Uh, but when that matures, I think it'll be a lot more aha. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. Now, before the call, when we were talking about the venture capitalist model, there was something that was really interesting that I think we haven't actually talked about on this show. And that's kind of how the venture capitalists are just getting rich off the LPs 
just off their their management fees and that could you dive into that because for me that was really interesting and i think our audience would also like to know a little bit more about that yeah i'll tell it with an anecdote i was on um i was in nantucket for a board meeting at dime and this is when we were flush at high scale profitable doing really well and we went on like a mood or like a dinner kind of drink tour and they were pointing out a bunch of our vcs were pointing out um, a, a, a contemporary peer VC's house, this mansion on the cliffs of Nantucket. And so I said, well, what, what did he do before he was a VC? And they said, well, what do you mean? He's always been a VC. I said, oh, okay, well, what investments did he make? And, they're, and they were all scratching their head. Like he did something amazing in the early nineties. I can't remember what, what company was, I don't know. I don't know. He's just, I don't know. He's just a VC, you know? And I was like, well, so you can buy a house like that, <laughs> just being a VC who hasn't sold a company on his own or built the company as an operator and who you can't even think of any of the investments he ever made. That's amazing. And the reason for that is, and this is playing true with the larger and larger funds, is if you think about a two to 3% annual management fee on a 500 million, billion, $3 billion fund, that's a ton of money running around. And so, you know, the average venture capitalist just on management fees alone can make half a million to a uh, million dollars per year. And, you know, depending upon where you live, that can go a long way. Um, and, and that's whether or not they're good or bad investors. So what I always like to say is that the client of a venture capital firm or a private equity firm or a hedge fund is the LP. It's the, it's the money. And most of the LP of those firms is institutional money. It's endowments, it's pensions, it's fund of funds. And, and it's not the entrepreneur or the founder they back. Um, they're successful. They're making great money, upper quartile, upper you know one percent money um, by just being an investor, managing fundraising, managing and deploying capital into the asset class, whether or not they're good at it or not. Now, that's a knock generally on the industry and the model and the structure that's been around for thirty years. There are great investors. There are great you know, upper quartile funds, there's clearly also really valuable venture capitalists. But again, the problem with the construct is that not a lot of the early stage investors or smaller funds can, can actually afford to hire and scale resources and infrastructure to actually help the startups stay back. And that's why we eliminated the management fee model because we were like, we want the entrepreneur, the startup to see us as having aligned incentives and focus day in and day out how do we build a sustainable operating company to support them and be in the school of hard knocks, scaling our recurring revenue business, and at the same time, only be rewarded when they win, we win, our investors win, we all win together. So again, just trying to flip the script a little bit and be a little bit entrepreneurial about it. Speaking of that top quartile of VCs, how important do you think that name that Sequoia invested in, in this company or that Anderson Horowitz? was, how important do you think having that name is moving forward in the future in the whole startup ecosystem? Listen, I think if you're playing um, Moonshot, right, and you're chasing deck of corn or bust, I think the Sequoias, the Excels, the Andreessen's, the Batteries, the GCs, um, they're critical, right? Um, I also think you're seeing like later stage private equity, the Toma Bravas, the Vistas, looking more like strategics, right? Like they look like the Microsofts, the Googles, the Oracles of a decade ago. All those companies are doing full management buyouts and recaps, right? So I think if you're playing that game, which again is big company swing for the fences game, that's great. But if you're a bootstrapper or you're trying to maintain control of your company, or you're trying to preserve optionality. I mean, look at MailChimp as an example, where you own your company, you're in charge of your destiny, you can run it for 20 years, do incredibly well along the way, but also then see an exit when you're ready. Um, that's just a different game to play. I think the that's a that's 99 though, 99%, 99 and a of all companies that get created, they're not going to be Stripe or Splunk or Square, right? Or MailChimp. And I think the problem is if that's all you're playing for, um, you're in trouble. So again, those people is nothing better than the validation of a red point, right? Uh, or, or a tier one VC in year round. Um, but again, that should be, you should preserve the optionality and that should be unlocked for you based on your outlier performance to get there, not just to do it for the vanity of it all. I got to ask another question about smart money. In your mind, what is considered smart money? 
some people would say maybe that logo alone is is worth it but yeah i, I want to hear from 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 you yourself <laughs> yep. expectations for smart money yeah, listen, I think that logo alone is worth it if you're a darling and you, and you continue to perform. I think what those funds do is they abandon you if you suck, right? Um, if, if, you're a top, if you're a top performer, they're going to put everything behind you. They can. They're going to recycle money and put more and more cash into you. If you're not, though, you're kind of stuck in no man's land with those funds because, again, those funds are returned by the top performers of their fund, right? Um, not by everybody else. Where in our model, each deal has to stand on its own. You know, we win if a deal 1.2 X, that's a, that's good. Return money and move on and the, everyone gets paid. I think smart money though, where I like to talk about this most is in the earliest stages. When you're trying to figure out product market fit, trying to figure out how to build out and round out your executive team. When you're trying to build the brand we discussed earlier and figure out your go-to-market motion and get from, you know, no ARR to a million to five to 10 to 20 million ARR in a real pragmatic, successful company. That's where I believe you need the most assistance and the most help. Again, the problem though is a $50, $100 million fund with a 2% management fee has you know three, five people working there doing lots of deals per year to get the spread of deals at the earliest stage. And they can't possibly bring a ton of value to you with such a small team and such a small staff, right? So I think smart money in the early stage is really trying to find an integrated partner who can bring a bunch of muscle resource, um, iterate, you know, be malleable about what they're helping you with based on what you need in that moment. Kind of a Swiss army knife smart money in the early days. I think in the later stages is when it becomes a lot more surgical and a lot more um, specific and strategic. And again, that's when a huge fund could be a huge help because maybe it is just capital and their network and their other portfolio connections um, that help you. But that's, again, once you've got that foundation there. What you're also seeing is when you see like a Tiger Global come way down market, I think they're doing like something like a deal a day or something. It, what ends up happening there is it's almost like too democratized. Or you see the crowdsourcing websites like the AngelList, it's it's too democratized, it's too passive, it's, it's too peanut butter and spray and pray, which means, again, they're not going to bring a lot of value to you, right? Right? So you're kind of left naked in the streets saying, okay, I got to figure this out on my own. Um, and so I think there's just a, an interesting smart money dynamic at the earliest stages that uh, York IE is trying to solve. How are you getting access to have the conversations with the best startups? Or how should someone think about, hey, I'm new to VC, I'm either raising my first fund or I've raised my first, or, or, or that where they can demonstrate or have those connections with the best startups? How does that, how do you go about doing that? I mean, a big part of how we drive awareness and visibility and deal flow for York IE is no different than we would as we're, as we're casting a wide net to drive demand for our product and for our services. Our platform fuels a market competitive intelligence platform. Our services are for all these growth efforts from marketing to sales, to finance, the product, right? So when you look through this thing, what we're doing is we're putting out a lot of educational content. Again, it's why I'm on the podcast for season three, right? Build more awareness, have people come to york.ie or website, learn more, follow along. We think of it as a very single funnel approach. By doing that, by practicing drumbeat marketing, by driving a lot more eyeballs and building more and more community, then when companies are looking to capitalize themselves, they'll be better educated. They'll come and talk to us. And we're never the whole round, right? And we might not even be the right fit. We focus on B2B SaaS. You could be a consumer startup or a hardware startup or a marketplace startup or a med tech startup. We're going to help make connections for you through our ecosystem um, and, and get you in the fold. I think... For if you are brand new to the idea of raising capital, so the inverse of that, if you're brand new to that, how do you, do you get smart? Well, that's why there's all these great tools like our Fuel platform or PitchBook or Crunchbase to be able to go research your sector, what investors are active in your sector or in your geography or in your business model or in your market and get smart. And when you reach out, don't just go reach out cold, reach out with a little bit of context like you would any prospecting. Uh, I, I like to remind founders that fundraising is like the ultimate sales pitch. Uh, you know, it's you've got to actually sell yourself, but you also need to remember that you're also the free agent, right? And you got to be very selective because when you raise money from even if it's angel investors or, you know, from venture capitalists, you're selling a little piece of your company 
every single time. And, you know, if it's a VC, then you're selling a little bit to a bank, right? Um, and that's a unique model where we've tried to fit in on your IE's side is to be early, early stage so that when the VCs come in, we're playing a little bit more pitch and catch and matchmaker and that they look at the companies. We're not an institutional investor because we don't have institutional LPs and we're not an institutional fund. Our hope is that they look at it like they're um, not just co-investing with us, but investing in York IE companies as us as operators and operators helping operators across the portfolio. And again, it's just a little bit of a different mind shift um, that we've been trying to bring. So you'd mentioned fuel. Uh, some uh, as part of your company, but I mean, what is it? I, I'm not really sure. Can you tell us a little about yeah. that? Yeah. So one of the biggest things that we were able to create in our careers as operators was what we called the market and approach to company building. I mean, so many tech companies get built based on a product idea, and then that product idea gets iterated on and then taken to market. We look at it more as how do you know your market, your competitors, your comparators, uh, large public contemporaries that you're tracking towards the strategics in the market, and then be the most prepared uh, person in the room at building your company from a market in perspective. What go to market to build? What pricing and packaging to build? How do I differentiate and position and then drive product roadmap um, and portfolio evolution? And so that's very different than the way that most software companies or any company gets built based on that kernel of an idea that then gets taken to the market. So we decided uh, to build a SaaS platform, uh, Fuels, a data and automation platform. You should think of it like an operator version of a pitch book or a crunch base or a capital IQ. Um, or, or a private company version of like the Bloomberg portal, right? We've created a private company database where we're curating complete company profiles. Those profiles roll up into market databases and then we're doing a bunch of um, custom research and enable live chat capability to talk to operators and analysts, uh, download uh, lectures and curriculum to help you um, build that market and approach to company building and scale your company. So it, it's it's going really well. Um, we we just launched this in May. The first thing we launched as a firm is our investments business. And in the summer of 2020, during the pandemic, we publicly launched our advisory services practice and have seen uh, re really a ton of adoption there. And then just this past summer, we launched Fuel. And we built it, honestly, originally for ourselves. We built it to make our investments practice, our diligence process, our tracking, reporting, uh, more seamless, integrated, uh, captive. And then we also built it for our advisory services to maintain higher margin on services, to offer tech-enabled services, to scale our teams better and faster and do more automation of the work we were doing for companies using our platform. And then what happened was the startup started to ask for it. Um, uh, self-service. They said, well, well, can we just get access? Why are you sending me the reports out of fuel? Or why are you PDFing me a company profile? Can I just use the platform myself? And that's when we decided to launch, launch it public. And so we think about it all integrated together, Sean. We think about put a bunch of content out to the world about how to build and scale startup, you know, let people subscribe to content for free, set up a free fuel account to track their comparators, maybe set up a paid account, a team account, enterprise account. If they, if they need more help, sign up for some of our white glove advisory services, tech enabled services on top of the platform. And then if it's a B2B SaaS company looking for capital in the early stages, we're growing our capital pool. We have about 10 million per year in our evergreen syndicate today. And we're going to keep on adding more and more capital partners to that pool. We call our LPs investment partners. And what we'll do is we'll, we'll do the same number of deals a year, but it'll enable us uh, to do larger and larger checks and then double down on the winners along the way. So you said quite a bit about early stage companies, but I'm just kind of wondering, where do you think they're struggling the most right now in their executing to go to market? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the biggest thing that you see right now is um, what I like to call go to market motion, right? Um, I think a lot of times companies these days are trying to figure out, are we you know, self-service e-commerce? Are we you know, BDR AE inside sales model? Are we channel distribution? Are we enterprise sales, field sales? And I think it's very confusing for for founders today, regardless of age experience, because the, the way buyers are um, buying and 
and signing up for services and onboarding and expanding on products has become very, very bottoms up, right? Even in the most enterprise-like sales, you need to get the practitioner, the developer using the technology, um, the sales rep using the technology, depending upon the sector you're selling to, um, and then expanding it and bringing it to the account. So you're seeing a, a real interesting question and, and battle on what is the selling motion that best fits our product, our market, our industry, our competitive set. So I'd say that's that's number one. Uh, number two is definitely pricing and packaging. Back to our earlier point on, you know, contract terms, lengths, recurring revenue, consumption models. Um, this is very, very complicated. And I believe that the pricing and packaging is kind of the pinch of the hourglass where you have like the market in approach to the go-to-market motion to the pricing and packaging out to the product roadmap and the technical infrastructure and scale, you know, on the bottom of the hourglass, that pricing and packaging attached to your go-to-market motion, attached to your market uh, competitive differentiation and messaging is, is very, very complicated for companies to figure out. I think it's never been more easy to build product and capability, um, but how do you marry that end to end? And I, and I think there's just a little too much luck that goes into this product-led growth, PLG. Um, you know, it's really about building great end to end companies. And I think it's just tricky for companies to figure out those go-to-market motions to support that. And Kyle, we're right about to enter 2022. What advice, what wisdom can you share for companies going into next year? What insights do you have that people might find fascinating? Yeah, well, I think uh, I think you got to focus more and more and more on owned content channels going into 2022, especially in B2B SaaS. You really need to stand for something. Um, I, I think that's the biggest thing I can say is if you don't have a really, really strong vision and position on what you stand for in your industry, you know, again, at York IE, I make some big statements like the venture capital model is broken. Uh, the industries that are purpose-built to support growing companies are failing them. They're pay to play, they're siloed, right? Like these are really, really strong statements that I need to then go defend with fact and execution and, and references and, and scale, right? Um, and so I think you need to find those things in your company. And the only way you're truly going to be able to tell the world about it is if you have really tight messaging and you own your owned content channels. This podcast interview is a good example of an earned, you know, channel, right? It's, it's you know, we built a relationship, Sean, you know, here I am. You have to go earn it. What happens so often, and it's become very challenging through COVID, as more and more people are at home, is everyone thinks they need to go to the paid channels digital channels first. And there it's incredibly noisy. It's incredibly cluttered. And when you get there, you're competing with the biggest marketing budgets in the world, the biggest go-to-markets budgets in the world. So you have to stand out in a guerrilla style in your own way. And you really need to stand for something. Fantastic. This has been an amazing interview. Kyle, if anyone wants to find out more information about you, what you're working on, what's the best way to go about doing it? Awesome, Sean. Yeah. So I'm KYORK20 across all social handles and we're at York growth across all social handles and you can find us at york.ie fantastic we're gonna have all that information in the show notes Kyle I want to thank you for your time day on the Silicon Valley podcast for our listeners out there please go on iTunes give us a five-star rating if you found this content useful and please share it with your network also anyone out there if you're looking for a mid-market investment banker please connect with me on LinkedIn and all our information can be found on the Silicon Valley podcast.com and our social media channels, which all have the same uh, Sean Flynn SV. But with that, Kyle, I want to thank you once again for your time today on the Silicon Valley podcast. Thank you.